I am often asked when people see one of my batik paintings, how do you paint a watercolor batik? I recently completed this painting titled The Winnowing Basket, and I thought I would take this opportunity to share my process. This isn't literally a step-by-step -step demonstration. I will, however, take you through my personal creative process. Every batik artist has a different way of handling both the materials and the processes, and in this video I simply cover my own methods. I know if you give watercolor batik a try, you will develop your own personal approach. Let's go to the first step. Where do I get my inspiration? For me, inspiration in selecting a subject is the first step. I usually find that in a photograph. Be sure any photographs that you use are either not copyrighted, taken by yourself, or by someone you know and you have permission. I never copy the photograph, but instead find what has attracted me to it. I most enjoy painting people and animals, and most often it is the pose or position of the subject that interests me. After I study the photo and determine what it is that attracted me, I begin several quick sketches until the subject talks to me, and then a final composition is made onto a small piece of sketch paper, about 8 by 10 or 9 by 12. By the way, it never looks like the photograph. That was just a starting point. I make several copies of my sketch onto cardstock and then use watercolor pencils to work out my colors. This also helps me to discover any issues that might arise and correct them before waxing begins. After final details are worked out on my sketch, I scan it into my computer. This particular painting was done on a one-half sheet of gin washi, which measures 19 inches by 25 inches. I use my computer to enlarge my drawing to the desired proportions to fit the paper, and then trace the image onto the gin washi with a combination of pencil and an ultra-fine black sharpie pen. Before I attach the paper to my support board, I each time cover it with a new layer of Reynolds plastic coated freezer paper and I will be using push pins to attach the painting to my support board. Now that my paper is pinned to the support board with push pins, I begin to heat wax. I have it sitting in cans in a water bath in a small electric skillet set at 180 degrees. There are commercial wax melting pots that you can buy, but I find this works the best for me. While the wax is melting, I will sometimes paint in some small shadow areas. This does depend on the painting, but it usually gives me enough time for it to dry before my wax is completely melted. I most often use batik wax, but sometimes I will mix in additional paraffin wax, or on occasion, straight paraffin wax. It depends on the desired effect I'm hoping will come about, and this is something that you will learn only by practicing and trying the different options. This is a photograph of my favorite batik wax brushes. As you can see, most of them are old watercolor brushes and, in addition, a couple of utility household brushes. There's a saying among batik artists, and that is, once a wax brush, always a wax brush. What that means is if you accidentally dip one of your good watercolor brushes in there, into the wax, it is probably going to be a wax brush since you cannot get the wax out. I'm now ready to begin applying wax. I first apply wax to all areas that are to remain white, such as the stripe bands on her headscarf. When the wax solidifies, I know I can go ahead and move on and paint something else, such as, at this point, delicate areas such as the lips and nails. And I don't want a darker color to bleed into these, and when dry, I do wax those areas before beginning on the general skin tones. As I begin the skin areas of the arms, which when dry are waxed, then the face, shading where needed, and waxing when dry. It is, again, I reassure you that when using Jinwashi, it is important to paint these delicate areas first. 
With gin washi, the paint will often run along the fibers unless the wax stops the paint. If you're using another surface, you'll just have to practice and find out what its little idiosyncrasies might be. As you can see, this process requires a little bit of planning. I have already applied wax to the white areas, to the hand, to the face and the shoulder and the neck area, leaving out the white area of that small neck necklace, also the bands on the headscarf, which we will soon see taking shape later. I have put on the trim of green around her neck and the sleeve, and when those are dry, I will be waxing those. This is a close-up of the face area. I wanted you to note that I have waxed the white of the eye. Let that set before adding the iris. The pupil will be added later. Now I paint the dress. I want you to remember that everything else, the green trim, the hand, the face, the shoulder, those have all been covered with wax so that the areas of the dress that meet them it will not run into them, they will stay the color that they are. Again, planning is the key in batik painting. Once the dress is dry, I have waxed over it, and this opens up quite a few other areas for me to work with. I did paint the rim of the winnowing basket and let it dry and waxed it. Then I put the center of the winnowing basket in, and then that gave me the opportunity to move up and put in the first layer on the headdress of the indigo blue is what I used. Um, once all of these are dry, I do cover them again with wax, leaving a few other small areas to just get done as soon as I can. After I have completed the last small section remaining on the dress of the figure, I make sure that every part of her is covered in wax. This way, as I do the background, nothing will run into the painted areas I've already done, and I have the freedom to let the water just run and the colors mix to try to create a very subtle background, very ambiguous background. Once the background is entirely dry, and I don't usually like to rush this stage with a hair dryer, a uh, gin washi is very fragile when it's wet and it can sometimes tear and I like a chance for the colors to move and run as they would like. So it's all dry and now I'm going to add another layer of wax over the entire painting. You have to realize there are areas now that have a minimum of four to five layers of wax on them and uh, it looks sort of diffuse to look at but you, you can still see it and you know pretty much where it's going. So. Add that last coat of wax and let it set, and make sure it's set very well. If it's a hot day, you might want to take a bag of ice cubes and gently roll over it so that the wax is nice and cool. Now that the final layer of wax over the entire painting has been set and cooled if necessary, I gently remove all the push pins and slip my hand under the painting between it and the support board and release it completely from the support board. Uh, during this process some cracks appear. You can also add cracks by simply bending the paper a bit and you can see usually where the cracks will appear. When that part is done, I take a wash, a medium concentration usually of indigo or another combination that might fit best with the painting and I paint that over the entire surface of the painting. While that dark indigo wash is still very wet, you're going to take melted wax and brush over the entire painting again. The purpose of this is to push some of that wash into those cracks that you made earlier. Otherwise the paint will just sit on the top. So again, just go ahead and put that wax right over the wash. Give it a few moments to set and then get prepared to remove the wax by ironing. For the process of removing the wax from the painting, I use an old iron. Make sure that it is not steamed, that it is on dry and on cotton or linen. I use blank newsprint that I've purchased to put against the painting 
and then other old newspapers over that as I iron to release the wax. This takes several layers and can be quite time consuming, but be sure all the wax is removed from the painting. If you're using a thin paper such as gin washi, the final step will be to mount the painting onto a piece of archival white matte board. You can use a spray adhesive as long as it is non-reactive and safe, or even yes, paste. The choice is yours. Make sure that uh, you set the painting flat to dry once you have put it against the board. Sometimes, especially if you use the paste, it will tend to curl or buckle. Let it dry overnight flat. Then you're ready to frame. Display your beautiful batik. The batik painting is pretty much completed at this point. I don't like to do a lot of retouching. Uh, occasionally, if you do need to do a small area, gouache will usually do a good job. Since there still is a little bit of wax in the paper, watercolor tends to be resisted and not leave too much of a color. So this is something that you can experiment with. She's ready to frame now and I enjoy doing this and sharing it with you. I hope that you'll look at my other videos on the Miguelia Rose Studio channel on YouTube and other works I have posted on my website, MiguelaRose.com. Thank you for visiting and sharing this time with me. Bye.